For the next five minutes, we'll show you scenes from the 53-minute video for the McGregor 26. The video shows just about everything there is to know about this remarkable boat. I hope that you like what you see. The boat's one of the fastest, safest, and best handling of any of the tradable cruising sailboats. It's a very easy boat to learn to sail. You can learn to get from here to there reasonably well in a single afternoon. The 26 is also a very capable powerboat with speeds up to 24 miles per hour with a 50 horsepower outboard engine. Here's the boat with a reefed mainsail, sailing into a strong 20 mile per hour wind. Try this with any other sailboat. It's not the fastest ski boat in the world, and you'll never pull a crowd, but you can have a lot of fun. Unlike most of the waterbound sailboats that are limited to their local waters, these boats can easily be trailered behind most standard cars to any lake, river, or ocean. The mast is light, and you can just put it up there like this. Or you can use the mast raising system. It's so easy that even a youngster can do it. Rigging and launching takes about 10 minutes. Look how low the boat sits on the trailer, lower than any competitor. It can be floated off the trailer without drowning your car. After launching, a valve is opened and 1,500 pounds of water fills the ballast tank. This added weight provides the self-riding stability and the performance of a conventional keel. Coming back, the boat's driven onto its trailer. This is as simple as it looks. After the boat comes out of the water, the valve is opened and gravity drains the 1,500 pounds of ballast. This keeps the boat light for easy trailering. The boat draws only 9 inches of water and you can run it right up on the beach. This is the cruising spinnaker. It's colorful and fun to fly. When sailing downwind or across the wind, it adds a lot of speed. The weathertight cabin provides three large double berths. The rear berth is larger than a king-size bed. You have to spend a lot more money to find these accommodations in a powerboat. There's a fully enclosed head, a full galley, and a 48-quart removable ice chest. This is the king-sized rear berth. The dinette converts to a third double berth. The boat will sleep six comfortably. This is a big crowd, but it is possible. The optional sunshade can be left in place for powering and sailing. Even with the water tank empty, it's far more stable than most boats of its size. We pull the boat over with the tank full. It takes 120 pounds on the mast to hold it down like this. When the mast is released, the boat rights itself. The solid foam flotation keeps the boat afloat when flooded. It won't sail fast this way, but it beats swimming. Here we see a very fast cabin cruiser. Without the 1,500 pounds of water ballast, this thing really goes under power. When it blows hard, you need less sail. Here it's sailing with just the mainsail. This is the furling system for either the jib or the genoa. You can make a perfect match between the amount of sail that you have up and the strength of the wind. Notice that the sail shape is really good no matter how much sail you have rolled out. Watch how closely the boat sails into the wind and how easily it tacks. We build this boat in one of the most modern and efficient plants in the industry. We've built 35,000 sailboats over the last 26 years. Here's the finished hull being pulled from its mold. Notice the high gloss and the molded in accent stripes. Here are the fiberglass pieces that make up the boat. The rudders, hatches, and other small parts are at the bottom right. Then comes the deck liners, the deck, the hull liner, and the hull, still in its mold. After all the hardware is installed on the hull and deck, the two finished parts are joined. Here the boat's being set on its trailer. We build our own trailers. After going through a rigorous inspection, the boat's rolled out. At peak production, a boat comes out every two hours. These boats represent just a few days' production. We'll finish this introduction with a few pleasant scenes that give you an idea of what the McGregor 26 is all about.
Because of the water ballast system, which we developed and which is now the standard throughout the industry, the tratering weight can be kept low, allowing the 26 to be tratered by standard cars. The empty boat weighs only 2,250 pounds. The trader weighs 710 pounds. The boat's width is just under 8 feet, and it can be legally trailered throughout the United States without permits. Permits are frequently required for widths over 8 feet, and always required for loads over 8 foot 6 inches. Here we're headed out across the Mojave Desert. You won't need a tow vehicle this large, but if you have one, you won't even know the boat's back there. Notice how the mast is carried for trailering. Watch how easy this is. If it's easy, you'll use the boat a lot. If it's hard, you won't. The light weight makes launching very simple. It's no more difficult to launch this boat than most small power boats. Notice the car's rear wheels are not in the water. Every inch higher a boat sits on the trailer means that the car has to go one foot further down the ramp. The ladder on the nose of the trailer lets the crew get on the boat without a lot of effort. The bow tied on is released, and the skipper starts the motor and backs the boat off the trailer. The boat's quite happy with all of this. The boat's light and can easily be pulled up the ramp and out of the water. On the other hand, if the boat's too heavy, you'll get a lot of this. The water ballast system is the key to the 26's lightweight and versatility. The 1,500 pounds of water ballast provides the self-riding stability of a keel, but it can be drained out to radically lighten the boat for trailering or high-speed powering. The ballast, nearly half the weight of the boat, substitutes for fixed lead or cast iron keels found in most boats. This is the water ballast valve. When you launch the boat, the valve is opened and the tank fills. Gravity does the work. There's a vent under the step that allows air to be released as the tank fills. There's a second valve shown here that speeds up the filling process takes about six minutes. The tank is full and the boat's ready to sail when you can touch the water in the vent hole. Then you go sailing. When you retrieve the boat on the trailer, you drain the tank. Again, gravity does the work. The water tank can be emptied in the water when the boat's going over eight miles per hour. Open the valves and the forward speed sucks the tank dry. This is a typical launch ramp. Watch how little effort is expended getting the boat off the trailer. Everyone stays dry, and the car stays out of the water. The centerboard retracts completely into the boat, where it can't be damaged when the boat comes on or off the trailer. The kick-up rudders can also be retracted completely out of the water. Here again we see how the boat can be beached. With most other sailboats, you'd now be stuck in the mud in chest deep water. Here's a competitor whose centerboard does not retract completely and therefore subject to damage. The McGregor's water line is only 27 inches above the ground. No other sailboat is lower. These are Catalina 22s. 36 and a half inches. This is 125. 56 inches. These are Catalina 25s with their retracting keels. 47 inches. This is 123. That's 33 inches to the scribed water line and to the little scum line where it's been sitting in the water. 126 measures 36 inches. Here's 123. Look how far into the water the car had to go. This poor soul cranked ferociously for an eternity. He'll be getting tired. 
Extension tongues are frequently used, as for this Catalina 22. Ramps are designed for normal length traders, and when one of these long ones goes off the paved part, major outside help is often needed. Or, you can always just wait in there. If you listen really carefully, you can hear the dishes breaking. Notice how the boat stays aligned on the trailer because of the vertical goal posts at the rear of the trailer. Some trailers don't have these. Without these posts, things can get a little screwed up. See the wide V at the nose of the trailer? It's a big target and easy to hit. It's padded and you can plow into it pretty hard. Without the ears, it's pretty easy to slide right past and maybe punch out your car. With the 26, you simply drive on and go forward and tie off the nose. The ladder keeps our hero out of the water. Without the ladder, which gives you somewhere to stand, securing the boat can be fun for the spectators. When you pull the boat out, our engine clears the ground in the down position. If the designer had given this rig another inch or so, this skipper's life would have been improved immensely. To raise the mast, first disconnect it from the bow public and roll the mast base to the rear. And slide in the hinge pin. The mast is light and you can just put it up there. It takes a bit of oomph, but it's not too tough. The four stays connected, and the turnbuckle provides the final tensioning of the rig. For trailering, the only mass support wire that has to be disconnected is this one, the four stay. Using the mast raising system, it's really easy. A kid can do this. The 26 has a back stay, a wire running from the top of the mast to the rear of the boat. This is a critical support when running downwind in heavy air. We're on this side, and the good sailing's over there on the other side a common problem. Here's the solution. Even with the boat underway, the mast can be lowered and raised with or without the mast raising system. He'll pull the mast up without using the winch. You can also keep the boat in one of the low-cost mast up storage yards that are near most launch ramps. This is a typical one. Entering the cabin, the galley's on the left, and the fully enclosed head is behind the door on the right. Unlike most of its competitors, this boat has full standing headroom. The dinette is forward of the head, and there's a seat for two opposite the dinette table. The cushions and carpet can be removed. The rest is polished fiberglass, and you can squirt down the interior with a hose without risk of hurting anything. Many small boats have fabric permanently bonded to the insides of the hulls and decks. These present serious mildew problems. Make sure it's removable. This is the front double berth. Note also that there's no interior woodwork. Woodwork means work for you. The rear berth is a full 7 foot 3 by 6 foot 6, a full king size bed. This is rare in any boat. There's full sitting headroom over a large area of this berth. It's full standing headroom if you're 36 inches tall. The forward view from the cabin can be quite rewarding. It's nice to be able to see out. With most boats, you're stuck with small side windows and usually no forward window. The dinette is set up high so you can see out when seated. This is the electrical panel.
Here's a scan of the galley with its tile countertop and optional alcohol stove. This is where we put the VHF ship to shore radio. It can be used while seated in the cockpit. There are lots of convenient places to store stuff, big and small. Here's a big storage compartment under the sink. And this is the battery compartment. We also use it for storing extra line and small items. The galley has a sink and pump for fresh water. The boat's water system holds 10 gallons. Here we look under the cushions and the hatch covers. There's a big storage compartment under each one of the seats and berths. This is the 48 quart ice chest under the rear dinette seat. You can take it home for packing. The dinette seats five and it converts to a third double berth. Notice the mass support post. On many boats, this comes up in the center of one of the double berths. This, of course, is not good. This is the head, the fully enclosed head. Most other small sail and power boats have a head tucked under a bunk. A slight amount of imagination will bring vivid pictures of how awful these things are to use when others are on the boat, particularly when they're sleeping. It's essential to have four walls and a good solid door. The cockpit's self-bailing, the seats are comfortable, and big enough for sleeping outside or for sunbathing. Wheel steering is standard. It's a far more natural way to steer than a tiller and takes up a lot less room in the cockpit. The captain's seat hinges out of the way for access to the motor and for boarding. This is way better than climbing over the edge of the boat. This shows the cockpit cushions. The captain's seat is now closed for safety and for providing the captain with a place to sit and steer. The open transom is neat for getting on the boat when it's on the trailer. This cable secures the seat in the open position. This shows the anchor locker and foredeck catch, both closed. Here they are open. The hatch gives great ventilation. This shows the strong bow eye, the cleat, and the bow rail. And this is the hinge mast step. These are the tracks and blocks for the standard jib. And these are for the Genoa. This is all first class hardware. We don't use turnbuckles here because, for traderable boats, we think that they're dangerous. Mast wires occasionally get tangled up on the trader fenders and deck hardware when the mast's going up and down, and a load from the wrong direction can bend turnbuckles. Several bends and restraining can cause failure. The adjusters that we use are stronger and safer. The hole spacing allows adjustments as fine as 1 16th of an inch. The sail handling winches are on the cabin top. Lines lead through cam cleats to the cockpit. The centerboard control line on your left also leads back to the cockpit. This is the main sheet, the line that controls the angle of the mainsail. Mounted on top of the steering pedestal, it can be reached from anywhere in the cockpit. There are strong lifelines and a bow rail to help you stay on the boat. The cockpit lockers will hold two standard nine gallon fuel tanks. This is the boom vang, which keeps the boom from rising as the sail fills. It's not essential, but it makes a much better sail shape and a lot more speed. The rudders can be raised and lowered from the cockpit. If you hit something while sailing, they, like the centerboard, will kick up out of the way. This is the optional sunshade. There's lots of headroom, and the boat can be sailed and powered with it in this position. 
Here it is stowed with its cover secured. It takes only a few seconds to raise or lower it. The optional boarding ladder and swim ladder is really useful, both in the water and on the trailer. And now for some sailing. Watch how easily the boat tacks. That bird coming head on is a pelican. We nearly collided with some of his pals. Here's the big race in very light air. The outcome was never in doubt since the McGregor 65 is the fastest production sailboat ever built. Here's an extreme example of blanketing where one boat, the 65, steals the other boat's wind. Two boats going in the same direction always results in a race and sailboat racing is fun. Watch how close the boat sails into the wind. Also notice how easily it tacks. This is Lake Mead, the big desert lake behind Hoover Dam. The wind is about 10 miles an hour, the weather's warm, and life can't get much better. The forward sail is the optional Genoa. It's big and provides a lot of power. You can learn to sail in a single afternoon. Read a primer on sailing. Choose a nice day with a light breeze when you don't have to get anywhere in particular. Turn on the engine and power around. It's not much different than driving a car. Then put up the mainsail and let the wind provide some power. The engine will get you out of any tight spots. After you see how it all works, try the jib. It's one of the easiest boats to sail that you'll ever find. More people have learned to sail in our boats than in any other. Notice that in a lot of these scenes, the boat's being single-handed. It's easy. And there's a lot to be said for occasionally sailing off by yourself. This is the lighthouse at Angel's Gate, the main entrance to Los Angeles' busy harbor. Notice the boat's stability and smooth ride. In this breeze, the crew does not have to hang out over the edge to keep the boat level. All controls are within easy reach. There are faster power boats around, but so what? They can't do this.
the dark side of sailing. This looks straight out of Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean. The boat's sailing with the mainsail on Genoa in a fresh 12-knot breeze. The rig's quite pretty, very efficient, and very strong. A boat that's fast and that handles well, like this one, is easy to sail and safer. It'll certainly yield greater long-term enjoyment than a slow, unresponsive turkey. There's almost no wind, but look at the wake. The boat's still moving. Since we're sailing so close to a rocky shore, I left the engine running at idle to get us out of any trouble, like having the wind quit. Having the engine available is a big safety factor. If you somehow screw up your sailing, it has lots of power to overcome whatever weird thing that the sails are trying to get you to do. Here are two 26s racing, one with a jib, the other with a Genoa. Winds are about 8 to 10 miles an hour. You can see that the Genoa gives a decided speed advantage. Here we're sailing along with one of our older 26 models. Here it's sailing with just the mainsail. Even without the jib, the boat remains highly maneuverable. The wind is blowing between 18 and 20, and sailing is effortless. Try this with some other sailboats. We're sailing backwards into the boat's berth with just the mainsail under perfect control. We rigged a line from the end of the boom to the front of the boat to hold the boom out. When you get to the dock, release the line, the sail centers itself, and the boat stops. Lift the captain's seat and get off the boat without having to leap over the rail. The boat's booming along with a reefed mainsail and the standard jib. It's blowing really hard. Look at how fast and steady it's sailing. The game is to keep the sail area down to the point where the boat's not leaning over too far. With reduced area, it'll be faster and easier to sail. Here the boat's charging upwind with the same rig. When the wind gets really strong, you can remove the jib altogether. As you can see, the boat still handles very well, although you'll sacrifice some speed. The best setup by far is to have the jib or genoa on a roller furling system so you can match the amount of sail to the strength of the wind. With modern furlers such as this, the sail keeps its shape even though it's rolled down to a small area. The furling line's released and a little more sail's let out. The sail shape remains nearly perfect. Finally the sail, in this case the standard jib, is fully unfurled. The winds are light, but watch the boat pick up speed as the sail fills. 
Here's the Geno on the furling system. For top performance, ease of handling, safety and stability, I believe these furling systems are absolutely sensational. With the furler, all sail and handling can be done from the cockpit and it's not necessary to go forward on the deck. This is important when seas are rough. In areas with heavy winds such as the Caribbean or San Francisco, the jib will be on the furler most of the time. In light wind areas such as Long Island or Seattle, the Geno would be installed most of the time. The vast majority of sailing is done in relatively light winds from 5 to 12 miles an hour. It takes only a few minutes to change from jib to Genoa on the furler and it can be done underway. This is a close up of the system. When furled the sail makes a very small diameter tube and causes very little wind drag. The furling line leads back to the cockpit. It's easy, simple and efficient. Save your pennies and you can buy that big thing going by out there. This is the colorful cruising spinnaker. It flies just like a Genoa, but it's a lot bigger. It's easy to control. Sailing across the wind or downwind, it adds a lot of speed. Here it's blowing about 14 miles an hour. In heavy winds, the cruising spinnakers will drive the boat at over 18 miles an hour, faster than most conventional boats will sail. The reason for the boat speed is its planing powerboat type of hull. Most sailboats have deep curved hulls. Their speed creates downward suction and they can't get up and skim across the top of the water like a high speed planing dinghy or a powerboat. Jibing's a snap. Nothing in the way of sailing performance has been compromised in order to make this a good powerboat. And powering performance has not been sacrificed in order to make it a good sailboat. Except that we've limited the engine size in order to keep the weight and complexity down. The boat powers well even with a mast up. No one will expect to see a sailboat to flash by like this. With this speed you can really cover distance and get to places that you could never reach with a conventional sailboat. When sailing the rudders are down and the wheel turns just the rudders. When switching to power the steering push-pull cable is disconnected from the rudders and connected to the engine. Then the steering wheel turns just the engine and the boat steers and handles like a conventional outboard powered boat. Under power, except at very low speed, the rudders are in the up position. The engine has an electric up and down. This is a back saver and you can trim the engine to change the angle at which the boat powers. If you don't like big engines, it puts along just fine with an 8 or 10 horsepower motor. Once again, it's the removable water ballast and the lightweight without the ballast that makes this high speed possible. Over the years, there have been many attempts to make a good combination powerboat and sailboat. They've been total failures because they were too heavy and had hull shapes that are not good for either powering or sailing. There's absolute proof that it can be done without compromising sailing or powering. And there it is. We now have a very fast sedan cabin cruiser. The mast and sails were left at home. There are no power boats on the market anywhere near the price that have the accommodations and comfort of this boat. Unless you have a very deep V, relatively unstable power boat hull, speeds of more than 24 or 25 miles an hour mean a lot of pounding and general discomfort, if there's any rough water at all. And they eat gas like hogs. Most cruising power boats and most exotic umpteen million dollar yachts are limited to speeds in the low 20s. The owners do not want to take the beating resulting from higher speed. 20 on the water feels like 80 on land. By limiting the engine to 50 horsepower, fuel usage is manageable. The engine can be hand started. And this is a biggie when the battery dies. The stresses in the hull are limited and the boat can be lighter so as not to sacrifice sailing performance. The boat's building up a full head of steam. 
In these pictures, the boat's going between 20 and 23 miles an hour. In general, boat speeds under power drop by about one mile an hour for each added 100 pounds. We didn't hit this big rock coming up. However, while powering on Lake Mead, we did hit a submerged rock at about 21 miles an hour. The boat jumped nearly out of the water. The engine kicked up as it should and the rudders kicked up. Except for some chips on the leading edges of the rudders and a nick taken out of the engine skeg, the boat and engine survived nicely. The engine mount area which took the brunt of the impact was undamaged. This is a dumb thing to do, but it was a good test. Even with the relatively small outboard, watch how quickly the boat jumps up on a plane. and how quickly the boat turns and how it leans just right into the turns. With just a small amount of centerboard down, steering controls far better than with any other outboard powered boat. This is one more good incentive to get the kids to come along, if you want them to come along. The toughest part for a boat is getting an adult skier up and running. As you can see, there's plenty of power for this. This is with the water tank empty. With 180 pounds on the rail, there's very little tipping. The flat planing bottom makes a good solid platform. With other boats, you'll see some really serious tipping when loaded like this. This is with a full tank. Even under power, if you get caught in heavy weather, the tank can be filled to make the boat less vulnerable to rolling. The ballast is a godsend for fishing or for living on the boat at anchor. There'll be a lot less bobbing around. With the tank full, we pull the boat over on its side. It takes about 120 pounds at the top of the jib to hold it down like this. When the mast is released, it rights itself. The boat floats on its side without water going into the hatches. A ballasted boat's like a kid's inflatable toy with a weight in the bottom that they use as punching bags. When poked, they pop back upright. We drilled a hole in the bottom to let the boat fill. This was the result. The solid foam flotation keeps it on top of the water. Most boats of this size do not offer this essential safety feature and their heavy keels can pull them straight to the bottom if they're damaged or flooded. Engines can quit. For a boat without sails, here's one solution. Embarrassing, but a solution. Here's another solution, but with a 26, you can still sail home. See the wind on the water? You can put away the paddles. Here are a few scenes that tell better than words what this sport's all about. With your own private island, you can enjoy all the beauty and seclusion that you want. Most of the world's truly perfect places are at the edge of water. You'll find an unlimited number of new and interesting things to see. This is an offshore oil rig. The environmentalists hate them, but they make great racing marks, especially at night. Many shorelines are loaded with wonderful restaurants. These can really brighten up a voyage. Sailing should not be without luxury. This is the famous Queen Mary, now trapped behind a wall. The dome was used to house the giant flying boat built by Howard Hughes. There's no lower cost or nicer way to spend time than sailing, and there are few things in the world that are as quiet, graceful, and romantic. And just downright fun. The boat makes a great camp trailer. You can keep it here for an overnight stay. Better yet, anchor on this pretty lake near Yellowstone in Idaho. Anchor it here for as long as you want, for free. Launch at this ramp for two bucks and play on the boat forever. This is the California coastline. It's probably the most beautiful shoreline on earth. 
The United States has thousands of quiet coves, anchorages, and secluded waterways. You can get away from the crowds. The boat's built in one of the most modern and efficient plants in the industry. These are the fiberglass pieces that make up the boat. At the right are the rudders, centerboard, hatches, and bulkheads. Next are the deck liners, and then the deck. Then the hull liner. It forms all the berths and cabinets. At the far left is the hull, still in its mold. You can see the molded in water tank. Here's the deck mold shop. We rely heavily on computers in all areas of the business. We use state-of-the-art computer modeling for all design work. Here you see three-dimensional renderings for the 26. These boats are designed on the computer and full-size drawings and cross-sections are plotted to create the master shapes for our molds. This is fiberglass roving that provides the basic strength of the laminates. It'll take loads of 35,000 pounds per square inch. This fabric has all the strands going in one direction. It's used for local reinforcement. This is fiberglass mat. It's made of short fiberglass filaments. It holds a lot of resin and provides stiffness and rigidity. This is fiberglass cloth, also made up of long filaments of fiberglass. The fabrics are cut to exact patterns. A stack of 20 boats worth is cut in a single pass. We start with a highly polished and waxed three-ton hull mold. The boat is built from the outside end, starting with the white exterior gel coat. The areas for black accent stripes are masked off. The boat's finish will be as good as the surface of the mold. This gun sprays both catalyst and gel coat. The catalyst causes the gel coat to harden and cure. Gel coat is a pigmented polyester resin. While the gel coat's wet, the masking is removed, leaving a window for the black color. Black is then sprayed to form the stripes. The entire surface is covered so that any trapped air will be visible during the layup process. After the surface cures, a layer of fiberglass mat is laid on the mold. Polyester resin is then sprayed onto the first layer of mat. The guns provide an exact mixture of resin and catalyst. Fiberglass cloth is then placed over the mat. Rollers, squeegees, and brushes are used to remove any air bubbles and excess resin from the laminate. This is where the real quality of the boat is determined. Additional layers of mat and roving are applied. This is hand layup, the strongest and most easily controlled method of construction. In some areas of the hull, there are as many as 15 individual layers of fiberglass. Other builders use chopper guns, which spray resin and short strands of fiberglass. We don't use them because they yield weak, heavy, and brittle laminates. Thickness will vary depending on the loads at each location. At high load areas, the finished laminate will be approximately 5 eighths of an inch thick. This is the nearly finished hull. You can see the molded in water ballast tank. With the hull still in its mold, the liner is bonded in place, forming the complete hull assembly. After the resin hardens, the hull is removed from the mold. Notice the molded in stripes and the brilliant gloss on the exterior. The hull liner mold has just been sprayed white. This is the finished hull liner before it's removed from the mold. And this is the hull liner after it's been removed. It's built like the hull, only not quite as heavy. This is the deck mold. The non-skid texture is formed into its surface. The black areas around the windows are masked off. And the deck is sprayed with white gel coat. The masking is removed very carefully before the white is cured. Black is then sprayed to cover the window area and make it easy to spot air bubbles during the layup process. The first layer of mats laid down and wet out with resin. This is the finished mat. The balsa core material is pressed into a layer of wet mat. After the bond cures, another layer goes over the top. There are cutouts in the balsa everywhere hardware will be located. Many layers of mat and roving are added wherever hardware is bolted or wherever there's high concentrations of stress. The completed deck is lifted from the mold. Notice the non-skid pattern and the black areas surrounding the windows. No further work needs to be done in the outside surface finish. It even comes out of the mold waxed.
This is the deck liner, which provides structure and a waterproof high gloss surface for the inside. Here are a few of the molds that make up the rudder centerboard, hatches, bulkheads, and other small parts. This large template router makes a perfect cut that exactly matches overhead pattern boards. It'll cut two inches of plywood or plexiglass. This is a mask going into its drill fixture. For every hole it's drilled, there's a foolproof fixture to prevent error. The mast is clamped in place. And the holes are drilled, exactly where they should be drilled. It's equipment like this rarely found in other boat plants that results in low cost and good parts. There are similar jigs for all parts. Here we're drilling rudders and centerboards. Most builders with so many different models never seem to get around to developing these labor-saving and quality-improving systems. Without this equipment, their costs are high, and these costs are passed on to you in the form of higher prices. Here's a drill fixture for deck hardware. Simple, but foolproof. When the drilled and trimmed fiberglass parts come into the assembly shop, a complete kit of parts, with all fasteners, is delivered to the assembly station and the parts are installed in the pre-drilled holes. Most assembly work is done on the hull and deck before they're joined. Fittings are secured with nylon insert stainless steel lock nuts that will not vibrate loose on the road or under sail. The deck is lowered onto the hull. The deck joint is sealed and fastened with quarter-inch stainless steel bolts and lock nuts. Most competitors use sheet metal screws or pop rivets. This system is better. The centerboard and its hanger are lifted into the boat. The bolt at the top secures it into the trunk. There are no through-hull fittings anywhere below the waterline. The board can be removed while the boat's on its trailer. This shows the centerboard being raised and lowered. Note that it retracts completely into the hull where it can't be damaged. The finished boat's being picked up by the chain plates and lowered onto the trailer. A detailed quality control checklist accompanies the boat through the production process. Here's our sharp-eyed inspector. After going through a rigorous inspection, the boats rolled out. At peak production a boat comes out every two hours. All the production equipment that you have seen is the reason we can build a better boat for far less cost than any other builder. All our waking hours are spent refining this production process just for this boat. Here finished boats about to be delivered. We're serious about building a lot of these things. We make our own trailers. Here some small parts are being cut. parts being punched. Here you see the side rails being loaded into a heavy strong welding fixture, accurate to a 32nd of an inch. All parts are welded. The hydraulic rams bend the side rails into exact shape. The trailer comes out of its fixture and it's rolled to an assembly and cleaning area in preparation for painting. A heavy coat of rust inhibiting primer is applied. This is an electrostatic spray system, causing paint with a positive charge to be drawn to the negatively charged trailer. The final coat is a high gloss, rust resistant black enamel. These are the finished trailers ready for their boats. They're light, simple, and strong. We put two boats in a container. The containers go by rail to our 90 dealers throughout North America. The boats arrive clean and damage free. The cost is very low. If you live anywhere else in the world, a ship like this will bring you your boat. Lest you forget what goes where, we provide a 26 page owner's manual telling how to rig the boat and how to do everything else necessary to take care of it. Here you see two of the 26's big powerful relatives, McGregor 65's, racing in the Pacific Ocean. These have been the best selling large yachts in the history of sailing. So there. In closing, we'll repeat a few scenes that might tempt you to try one of the most pleasant activities that the world has to offer. The boat gives you your own private island, and you can take it to any lake, 
river, or ocean. Volumes have been written about the delights of sailing because it has captivated man's imagination since the beginning of history. There are few things in the world that are as quiet, graceful, romantic, and just downright fun. There's a line from the classic Wind in the Willows. There is nothing, my young friend, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Sailing off in a strong, comfortable, and cozy little yacht will probably do more to brighten your life than almost anything that you can imagine. And the wind is free.